Hey everybody, I'm Christopher Mitchell from TravelingMitch.com and you're listening to Travel Fuels Life. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Travel Fuels Life, the show where we share stories, tips, and inspiration to help you live a travel lifestyle. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, and this week I have a special guest on. Christopher Mitchell from TravelingMitch.com is here. He is a writer and a freelance photographer. He is also the host of his very own podcast called Rick Steves Over Brunch, which is very interesting. He and his co-host go over some of the episodes of Rick Steves' shows and give their own experiences from those. So something for you to check out. And Christopher and I met in a strange way. We met on a bus going to Watkins Glen, New York. And so we had a nice little chat back and forth. And he was telling me all about his hometown of Toronto. And what really perked up my ears was when he started talking about his time as an expat in the country of Turkey. And there are some places that we sometimes hear a little bit unsettled. And so we wonder whether we really should go there or not. And so I thought it'd be great to have him on the show and share his positive experience that he had with the culture and the time that he had there. And he's got some fun stories to share with us as well. So from my home here in Greenville, South Carolina, it's time to pull up the laptop, jump on the World Wide Web, and connect with Christopher Mitchell. And Chris, you are joining us from north of the border, correct? That is correct. Yeah, it's uh, nice and cold up here. Um, <laughs> it's, so yeah, I'm uh, born and raised in uh, in Toronto. And um, when I was about 16, I sort of took off uh, and, and didn't really stop uh, properly until until about a year ago and now i'm uh, back in toronto and uh you know providing less worry for my mom and dad <laughs> uh which 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 is good but but in in all honesty it's, it's been actually really nice to get back to toronto toronto thankfully is a uh, is a very diverse city and um that means that uh, I, actually whenever i'm missing a particular culture i can just go to to that neighborhood uh in toronto because every everybody's got a neighborhood it, it makes world cup pretty fun and uh i'd like to think we're an example of uh of how a multicultural city can thrive um i'm biased though of course <laughs> right right oh i love canada and i travel up there quite a bit and i know canada in terms of uh immigration for a long time was very very proactive in trying to bring in people from all over the world. So, and Toronto seems to be the the gathering point, I guess, for everybody in Canada. Yeah, it is, um, and and I, I mean, it makes sense because I think the Greater Toronto Area has something like eight million people or something like that now. Which which which, when you think about it on the on the broader scale, that's roughly you know, one fifth, one fourth of the population mm. uh, of the country. Wow. So so it makes sense, and I think. Uh, as far as I understand it, uh, over half of Toronto uh, at, at this moment was born elsewhere, um, and that that makes it a great gathering point. Um, in, in a way, that's the that's the glue that makes everybody feel Canadian, and I think um, it's uh, it's a humbling thing because I'm born in Toronto, but but uh, you know that doesn't make me any more Canadian than somebody who's just arrived. Where we. I'd like to think that we're a city that has open arms. And to be honest, we, the whole country and city at large, we'd be nothing without, you know, the immigrants who came here. I, I think it's fair to say that Canada was built on the back of, of immigration. Uh, mm. There's no question. Yeah. So, so you've traveled to 79 countries, five continents. How has your experience with that um, multicultural Toronto changed in terms of, of your feeling from before you went to now that you've seen so much of the world? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it's changed tremendously um, because when I was a kid, I'd go to these different neighborhoods, you know, there's Little India or, or the Danforth, which is predominantly Greek. We have two Chinatowns. Um, you know, I, I think when I was a kid, I just assumed that that's how all cities were. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I, when I started traveling to other places, I realized uh, actually how special Toronto was in that in that regard. And I think actually growing up in Toronto prepared me to 
travel to other countries and and just sort of embrace the culture there um, nothing was terribly unfamiliar you know um, when I went to India for the first time I could recall I don't know going to a friend's house as a kid who was you know his parents being from India or what have you so I think it's sort of sort of it's sort of twofold on the one hand I started traveling and I and there were all these places that I I was so curious about because I had friends who were from there or what have you and then on the other hand I think uh, having left and traveled so extensively uh, thankfully um, I was able to have a new appreciation for how authentic Toronto is, uh-huh. uh, for example, I used to live in South Korea, and uh, when I'm really missing South Korea, I just go down to to Koreatown in Toronto and uh, and uh, get some barbecue, and then go to the Nurebong, which is uh, which is karaoke. And you know, for for some moments, you can almost forget that you're in Toronto, uh, minus the price. It's a little, little cheaper in Korea. <laughs> so, are you one of those that you go in and when you're tasting something locally, you go? Yeah, that really reminds me of of the place, or nah, maybe that's not quite as authentic as uh, uh, as I remember. I mean, I think I think Toronto is actually is 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 great in the in the sense of uh, it's not even someone trying to replicate what it would be. It's 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 just really the exact same dish with uh, with Canadian produce. Uh, for me, uh, I'm very cognizant of the fact that, particularly with taste, I feel like taste uh, really breeds memory. Um, and and for me, when I'm, I'm I'm sort of taste and smells bring me back to to other places. And so for me, actually, I'll mostly go by smell. If I walk into a place and it smells like my favorite local joint in Korea, for you know, then I then I know it's authentic. But I've I've always felt that uh, that taste is, is something that. Um, it really can transport you. Uh, and, and so sometimes when I'm missing a country or a mit, like for example, you know, having lived in Turkey for three years, if I'm really missing Turkey, I'll, I'll just go and get a Turkish breakfast in Toronto. And, uh, you know, and for a moment I'm transported back to, to Istanbul. That's awesome. Well, I, and it's funny because I'm sitting here thinking we're going to talk at the end about uh, you promoting Toronto, but you've done an excellent job of it so far. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. Didn't even have to. Uh, yeah, they should. Uh, they should be paying me more, huh? Yeah, there. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, um, how did you get started in terms of your travel? Did you did you play tourist a few times and see how that went, or did you actually move somewhere to get started? How did that all come about? Yeah. So, um, I would say that probably the. The seeds were planted uh, when my family, when I was about 11 years old, my family decided we were going to take the train from Toronto to Vancouver. Um, And if you know the size of Canada, uh, it took us roughly two weeks. Mm. But I remember uh, looking out the window when we were going through the Rockies uh, and seeing those snow-capped mountains. And I thought to myself, if this exists in Canada and I had lived in Canada my whole life and I thought what exists elsewhere and uh, and so that planted a seed for me uh, which I never really lost and and actually uh, when I was 16 I I actually spent a month in Ireland on my own Um, and I was doing a basically a writing program at Trinity College in Dublin Um, and I and I I realized kind of then and there that travel was going to play a tremendous role in my life because that childlike curiosity that I had when I was 11 years old, looking out the window, I've never lost it. Uh, and that's something I never think I'll lose because um, new countries, you know, excite me. There isn't a replacement for that excitement for me. Uh, when I'm on a plane going to a new destination, that feeling to me is, is priceless. Um, and, and there's no country in the world that I don't want to go. So, so I still have some work to do, obviously, but, um, I can't, I I can't say I'm upset having traveled to 79 countries and over a thousand cities. I always say this, that the Olympics are a lot more exciting, you know, because I have a, I have a personal connection to so many of those countries. And I think also travel is is a great, it's a great way to battle ignorance and to battle um, prejudice because when somebody mentions a country and, and says something about it, 
uh, I can unequivocally refute that based on my experiences. Mm. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I, you know, when I was younger, I used to move around from place to place. I lived in Philadelphia, then I lived in Dallas, and then I lived in Nashville. And my friends thought I was crazy. Where, where, where are you moving to all these different places for? But I, I, I sort of felt like you, you don't really get to know the people or the, the feel of a place or get a sense of of what an area is like until you actually get to move there and kind of integrate yourself in. And so I guess on an international scale, I can imagine how that really helps you build some friendships around the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I got married in July and uh, we had people coming in from all over the world. Um, and that was a, that was a great feeling. Um, it was a great feeling to look out and see all these people that we, you know, I was going to say collected, but I think connected with is probably a better, <laughs> yeah. a better uh, term. Um, and, and, you know, my, my wife loves travel as, as much as I do. Uh, I, you know, I feel extremely fortunate to have lived in so many different places. And I think, uh, I, you know, I, it's funny. I, I never really thought I was going to come home uh, per se. And I think home to me is an ambiguous term anyways, because I felt at home in Istanbul and Seoul and Oslo and Dublin and, mm. you know, wherever I was, I, I even, you know, lived it for a period of time in a town of 4,000 called Pearl Lagoon in Nicaragua. So, you know, I think for me, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I just cognizant of the fact that I, I feel blessed to have a lot of people in my life from all around the world and to, to be able to have those stories, uh, in my, in my heart, you know, it, it allows me to, to share stories, I think with, um, uh, with some genuine love and, and authenticity for the place that I'm writing about. Yeah. Now you mentioned Korea and Ireland was, was Istanbul the place you lived the longest or did you live somewhere else for a, a longer time? No, no, Istanbul was the longest. Um, and I think that's, I think that's why my love for Istanbul is so, so deep. And, and of course, uh, 2014 to 2017 in Istanbul was a, uh, you know, a tumultuous time. I think ha having stuck it out for those three years mm -hmm. uh, and seen and seen so much. I mean, it's it's kind of like uh, there's. I have a bond with that city and that country and the people of those country. That's you know almost unbreakable at this point. And I, and I think regularly of Istanbul. Um, in, in fact, all all the time. You know, I think it's that's a city. You know, where if you live there for three years, you're gonna carry that experience with you everywhere it's 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 I, it's an imprint on my heart you know so so what drove you to uh turkey initially did somebody say hey you know we've got a place for you to stay or w was it uh, a destination that you had had on your list for a long time so actually uh, it came about uh, my wife and i are both certified teachers in in canada we have our masters uh in teaching as well um but we actually were, went to a teaching fair, and uh, it's a it's a wild experience. It's in uh, Kingston, Ontario, and and there's hundreds of schools from around the world, and you just go and uh, you know they if there's a mutual interest, you have a, a meeting with them, and uh, so we had a whole bunch of meetings with a whole bunch of schools, and you have to basically sign on to to go to this place, kind of within. On the spot, you know, you you have to make a judgment call. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we had we hit it off with this school in in Istanbul, and uh, at the end of the day, they said, "Hey, do you what do you think about coming to teach for us?" And we said, "Sure, you know, let's do it." And uh, called the folks and said, "Hey, we're moving to Istanbul." <laughs> uh, we had been we had been to Istanbul in 2010, and uh, and loved it, and we just thought, why not? And I think. That's very much our attitude is that, um, you know, every place in the world has value uh, if you know what you're looking for. So I, I wasn't terribly worried about where I was going to live next. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I know my wife and I both feel like uh, we can make the best of any situation. I learned I learned Turkish and uh, I mean, I'm th I'm very happy we ended up there. But yeah, that's that's ultimately what happened. A school said, hey, do you want to come to Istanbul? And we said, let's do it. So did you, uh, what were you teaching? Were you teaching English or? Yeah, the, the subject. So I'm uh, not, not English as a, not ESL, but I was a, 
I basically had two homeroom classes and I would teach, uh, I was teaching the subject English to, to both of them. And uh, I taught primarily grade five and six. And I was doing a whole bunch of other things there as well. Um, I founded a, uh, a kind of an ex, uh, expat Canadian group and we had regular meetings. I wrote for a magazine there called Yabanji, which means foreigner. Mm -hmm. um, and I also played professional hockey in uh, in Turkey. Wow. So did not know that about I, you. Yeah, yeah, I was, <laughs> I was busy. So that was a really interesting experience because I was traveling, you know, via plane uh, all over the country on weekends uh, during the hockey season. Oh, wow. So um, you, you really did get to get a, a full view of, of Turkey as a country then. Exactly. Yeah. And I was traveling to cities and going into going into rinks all over. I played in the Turkish Super League. So it's the top league. So there was, uh, there was six other teams who were in the, the first division of the Turkish Super League. So I was traveling regularly to Izmir. And uh, of course, in Istanbul, friends would come out to games in Istanbul, which was which was a fun experience. And uh, uh, I went to, you know, some places which are closer to Russia, you know, like Erzurum. Mm. Uh, Erzurum is a mountainous, snowy city with a, with an affinity for hockey, I suppose. But that was a really interesting experience for, for sure. I, I, I love that, yeah. So how, how many uh, how many Canadians were on the team versus how many... Uh, I mean, was, I, I know you had a multicultural team, I'm sure. Um, were, is there a lot of uh, players from Turkey or were you finding, you know, you had a couple of mates from, from Canada there as well? Yeah, so I, I think there's some, some legislation that you can only have a certain amount of foreigners uh, mm -hmm. on each team, maybe five or something like that. So on my team, I had it was just me and one other American guy. Um, and, uh, but there were other teams, um, uh, with some Ukrainian players, Russian players, uh, I think predominantly U S, um, ru foreigners wise, at least it was predominantly, ru uh, Russians, Ukrainians, Canadians, and, and, and Americans. Um, and yeah, it was, I mean, it was, a, it was a tremendous experience. It's actually funny. I was, I was actually just drinking in a bar, uh, kind of my 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 local watering hole in uh, in Istanbul, and uh, I had a friend come over and say, "Hey, you're Canadian. You must be good at hockey." And I was like, <laughs> "Well, I feel like that's very presumptuous, but yes, yes, I'm good at hockey." And uh, he said, "You know, do you want to play hockey in Istanbul?" And I said, "Is that a thing?" <laughs> and, he said, it, and he said, "It is." So my my I. Uh, I went out for a practice and I borrowed a whole bunch of equipment and right after the practice, I said, can we sign you? Nice. <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, yeah, sure. Absolutely. And, uh, it was a fun experience. I mean, uh, uh, there was, you know, I, I, th I think I had a pretty good season. I, uh, I had a six goal game at one point and, uh, definitely hitting was, uh, was my forte. I mean, <laughs> uh, I could, uh, I could get away with a whole bunch cause, I think in Canada it's a you know big time hitting, so you better keep your head up. But I think some of the some of the Turks didn't know how to keep their head up, which made for some uh, some some beautiful hits. Nice, uh, yeah. And it was streamed live, so my parents would be watching uh, live streaming from from back in Canada, and uh, and they'd be like, "You I, you you really destroyed that guy." <laughs> but yeah, they they came after me for sure after I because I was hitting their star players. So they came after me, but I I welcomed it. I, I loved it. I thought it was a it was a blast. That's crazy. So, how much Turkish did you know before you went? Uh, I did, uh, some, some Duolingo and memorize and stuff like that. Some, just some basic programs to try to get me started. Uh, I probably studied intensively for six or seven weeks before I went and then, uh, and then continued to practice. I had a Turkish teacher who over Skype, um, I went to, uh, you know, meetups to speak Turkish. Uh, I actually really dove into it, but before I left, yeah, not much. Um, and I think I, th I think I thought that Istanbul would be more, um, I guess, accepting of just using English, but like, you know, you, you get ripped off if you don't know enough Turkish, oh, really? that's just the way it is. Okay. So yeah, I spoke, uh, I, I left, uh, nearly fluent. Wow. So I, and I guess after three years, it's a, it's a survival instinct to, uh, make sure that you got as much down as you, as you possibly can. Plus 
I guess if you're like me, when I travel or when I'm in a place, I want to talk to people. I don't want to just ask where the bathroom is. I want to, I want to know what they're about. And if I don't have their language, at least to a, a certain extent, then I feel like I'm missing something. Yeah. And I, th- and I, I think that feeling is, is actually totally warranted because, uh, you know, the experience, I mean, I don't want to, uh, call out any of my friends who didn't put in, you know, the, the same effort as me, but I think the relationships I was able to have with people in my, in the community, I mean, I went to a, uh, a barber in my area who spoke only Turkish and, you know, how much more rich was that experience? I mean, it was a rich experience because I spoke Turkish to him all the time. And when I left after three years and I, you know, I was able to sit down and be like, Hey, you know, this is my last haircut with you. And, uh, you know, basically tell him, you know, I got nothing but love for you. And he gave me a bottle of homemade Raka, which is the national liquor. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, it was so funny because at first our haircuts would be 20 minutes, you know, I'm figuring out Turkish, this, that, and the other, and it was more expensive. And by the end it was less <laughs> expensive. The haircuts would take an hour, hour and a half, uh, cause we'd just be chatting <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and he, he'd always get me a, a little bit drunk off of a uh, homemade, <laughs> homemade rocker. So for me, you know, it went from something that was pragmatic. I needed to get my hair cut to something which I genuinely looked forward to. Um, and uh, I think I, I think I gave him a bottle of maple syrup or something before I left, like, <laughs> like, like a good Canadian. Yes, absolutely. Well, you could give him some Canadian whiskey, I guess, if you, uh, if you want. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, exactly. So when you first got there, then, I mean, when, when traveling to, to different cultures, I've, I've heard people say, well, you know, it's better to probably not go in wearing blue jeans and looking like you're, uh, you know, American tourists when, when you go into the place. And after you've lived in Istanbul for a while and you're seeing tourists come in, what, what, what is your impression on a strategy that you should, uh, you should take when going uh, to a place like that? Should you try to blend in a little bit more or you, you feel like, uh, um, you know, it's, it's fine, just be yourself kind of thing? Yeah, it's a good question um, because uh, Istanbul is a place that's very difficult actually to travel to in the sense of uh, there's a lot of cabs that will rip you off. There's a lot of people who rip you off. I mean, there's not a lot of written down prices in a lot of ways. So you'll you'll sort of get what's coming to you uh, if you're if you uh, my my biggest advice would be to learn a little bit of the language. Um, I think it's not even about having a command of the language as much as letting people know that you respect the country enough to learn a little bit. Mm. Uh, and that's kind of my feeling about it. Uh, I think I'll, t- I'll tell you this. I mean, I, having lived there for three years, I took great pride in how, how, uh, how I was able to navigate that city because it's a very difficult city to, to navigate. And, you know, it's the sort of city where you either, find a way to to love it and and you thrive uh because you give yourself to the city or the city will kind of eat you alive i mean it's a city of it's uh, on an undocumented level probably about 20 million wow um and so so i think you have to be prepared for that um it depends what you're looking to accomplish there i think you could probably stay in the old town and just go to touristy restaurants and have that experience but i would strongly recommend learning some turkish um and coming in there prepared i think istanbul is a it's a it is a a difficult city in some way uh for a tourist but it's also deeply rewarding so if if somebody wanted to take an exploratory trip around turkey what uh besides istanbul like for me i'm not i'm not huge on crowds i definitely want to see istanbul but you know getting out a little bit beyond uh the the main touristy areas and finding some spots to go do you have some suggestions of places yeah definitely um i i think i mean first and foremost i think it's worth it to go to check out a few things which are really emblematic of what turkey's all about um Cities like Bodrum or, you know, Fethiye, Marmaris, or these sorts of places, uh, and Kosh, Alanya, et cetera, these are places which are on the shore and they really showcase the beauty of the, the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. I think history-wise, um, there's places like um, Ephesus, which is just incredible, ancient ruins and, and that. Um, I, I think if, if I'm 
you know, saying there's one thing that you need to see. Let's say you have two weeks and you're spending a predominant portion in Istanbul and there's only one place to go. Um, for me, 100% Cappadocia. Mm. Uh, Cappadocia is uh, the, the main city there is called Gurame. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an extraordinary place. Uh, there's, you know, what they call fairy chimneys and you can go um you can go uh hot air balloon riding and it's it's just phenomenal i think in general turkey just has no shortage of, of incredible places um i mean i even went to places which are kind of all turkish like trap zone i went to places like cheshme which are which are lovely towns um i i was lucky to spend a lot of time traveling around Turkey and I think you you know I spent three years doing that and mm -hmm. uh, and I would love to go back. There's more there's more that I haven't seen but would love to see. There's there's one spot that I really like to go to because I do these James Bond trips and so but this one is near Syria. So the question is, uh, getting that close to that area, uh, Adana is the is the town. Have you been down in that area? No, I haven't. The uh, the closest I came to. Um, dealing with uh, James Bond stuff would be in in Istanbul mm -hmm. um, in the oh my goodness I forget what it's called uh, it's a basement with water in it oh uh, yeah yeah oh my yeah. goodness I, it's, I remember now it's called the Basilica Cistern okay um, and it's it's right across from uh, the Hagia Sophia and the and the and the Blue Mosque as well um, but it's a really it's a really cool spot so you you did a you did a blog post actually on seven Turkish phrases. So um, give us give us an example of one of those seven phrases because they to me they as I was reading through that you were kind of giving a, a a feeling for how those phrases, especially the first one, which I won't try to pronounce since uh, you'll you'll do it much better than I did. But it kind of gave you a sense. It was something that we don't say in in English really, but it's a phrase that that you uh, you thought was a beautiful phrase. It kind of spoke to the uh, Turkish people and how they think. Yeah, and actually, I, I in that article, I was really trying to showcase phrases that we just didn't have in Toronto, and and, and that's why I said I think the article is something like you know I'll miss, I will miss it, and I think uh, yeah the first one's you know Kolay Gelsin, which you you know you you would say particularly at work, and you're just kind of telling someone you know I hope it comes it comes easily for you, and and I think. The main one that I used would be inshallah, and of course, that's uh, if you separate it, it's it's a phrase you're talking to Allah. You know, it's it's, it's religious, but it, it's become common where basically you're saying you make a comment, let's say mutloyum, which means I'm happy, and you'd say you know, you know, inshallah, you know, I'm 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 happy, you know, God willing, so to speak. Basically, you're you're saying. Inshallah, like you're you're accepting that fate exists. You know, you're saying, I hope this happens, inshallah. You know, and I, I loved, I always loved saying Afiat Olson, which was, you know, before every meal, you basically say bon appetit. Uh, you yeah. know, I hope I hope it's good. You know, you stop, Afiat Olson, you know, and you say, if you say a brother, for example, you say Abi, you know, Afiat Olson Abi, mm. you know. Yeah, I actually loved it because, um, you know, it, it would be the sort of thing where, Eventually, I'd be out in a cab with three or four other people, uh, and they would sort of turn to me and be like, "How can I say this?" You know, and I would, uh, I was kind of the go-to person for Turkish. And I think the the main thing is that it showed my commitment to to really diving into the city. I think uh, wherever I move to, I always try and learn the language, and I think it's just really it's the easiest way I know how to pay my respect to to the place and um i think there's a, there's far too many north americans who go to a place and and sort of just repeat english you know over and over again right. it doesn't make sense you know if somebody doesn't speak any english and you're like i'll have that one you know right. the person doesn't understand what you're talking about and, and ultimately just you know go ahead and point but uh <laughs> i i would say any place you're going to you should know the 20 most common words at the very least, you know, and I think that just really, it's, it's my way at least of, uh, of trying to show respect. I think what's happening around the world, I mean, I'm not upset that English has become the language that everybody wants to know a part of. I, I'm not upset about that, but at the same time too, um, I don't want that to wash away 
languages, you know, because I think it, it's my, at least it's my feeling that, um, you know, being nearly fluent in Turkish before I left, I developed a lot of relationships with people because they knew that I didn't necessarily have to do that, but I spent a lot of my own time doing that to, to try and get the most out of my time in Istanbul. So what's your sense of, of how things are in, in Turkey right now? And in a place where there's a elevated risk of terrorism or there's other bad news coming out, how should we, should we, should that taint our feeling about going to a place? Yeah, it's uh, it's a good question. I mean, for me, I think uh, there hasn't been a major attack. Um, I don't think since April of 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, and while I was there, I think there was probably seven or eight major attacks. And we actually watched one of them happen. We saw from a friend's wedding, we watched the the bombing outside of Besiktas Stadium, which I think uh, there was something like 150 fatalities or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I ended up speaking to CNN about it. But I don't think um, the Turkish people are extraordinarily resilient. Um, and I think it's probably no surprise that uh, Erdogan, uh, once he had full power, uh, the bombing stopped. I'll mm. say that. I don't think that was a coincidence. Um, and not because he's particularly powerful. I think uh, I think some of those bombings helped him to put forth legislation. I mean, after the coup, he, uh, he essentially, uh, I think he kicked something like or arrested 200,000 people, wow. you know, and including, including my friend who was a Dutch journalist. Um, and, uh, and that's allowed him to have control. And now that he has full control, uh, of the, of the country, I would, I would say it's, you know, it's fine. It, I think it's fine to go there. The other thing to remember too, is when I was living in Istanbul, my brother was living in Sydney, Australia and the park near his house, somebody was beheaded by somebody from, oh, wow. from, from ISIS. And so I think it's worth remembering that, for me, at least, I think you you should you should travel to the places that you have an interest for, mm -hmm. and you know what's going to happen is going to happen. Uh, you know, my, I was in a place where my parents were more worried about, and yet my brother was in Sydney, and that happened. And and I think ultimately, all you can do is is just continue to to chase that that travel bug that that you have inside of you. And and statistically speaking, the world's never been safer you know there there's never been a safer time to travel it's just that the news gets around faster and uh and that's ultimately what we what we focus on in the news is are these uh are these stories of uh i don't know you know terrorism etc right. but there's obviously so much more going on and i mean the next day in istanbul it might be a little bit quieter after an attack but people kept living life as it was, it was, I was, I it was extraordinary. Uh, it, it's funny because maybe again, it's part of, of your upbringing. You, you came from a multicultural area. I came from, I grew up in Detroit. And so when, when you've lived in a place that after you move away, you hear all these people saying, why would you go there? And is it safe? And all it, it, you suddenly start to realize that, um, it's, it's the information people are being fed and they're getting one side of the story, but they're not really getting to experience the, um, you know, what it's actually like there. And so people are holding themselves back from going to places that have a lot to offer. Yeah, exactly. And, um, I always really appreciate the quote from Aldous Huxley, you know, the, the author of Brave New World, who says that to travel is to discover that everyone is wrong about other countries. <sighs> and uh, and I think that's exactly it. I mean, that's why I'm so keen on travel, because we all have formed a bias. And it's important to go and challenge that. And I think uh, former Prime Minister for Canada, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, he said something along the lines of, You've got to leave your homeland to thank God for having one in the first place. Mm. And I think that's true as well. I'm not sure I knew why I appreciated Canada or what made Toronto special until I went to enough other places to be able to contextualize my life here. Uh, and I think both of those things, both of those quotes uh, are really things that I, I think about pretty closely when it, when it comes to travel. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, 
I'm going to say this is probably a good time for us to uh, wrap things up. We got a little bit of Toronto in there and uh, we got uh, Istanbul and, and all of Turkey. So we've, we've covered quite a bit, I would say. Um, what, so what's up next for Traveling Mitch? I, I saw you twisting pretzels the other day. So uh, <laughs> what's your uh, what, what kind of stuff you got coming up? Yeah, so lots coming up. Um, I, I also founded the Toronto Bloggers Collective. So we have an event next week. Uh, I had an event yeah, this week with uh, with Germany Tourism. Um, I was just uh, in the Finger Lakes again last weekend mm-hmm. for, for Thanksgiving. The next major trip that I'm going away, I, I'm doing a lot of stuff around Ontario. Um, my, my wife and I will be on the cover of the um, Hibernate and Style insert in the Globe and Mail in rough within the month. Nice. Um, so doing a lot of stuff around Ontario in that regard. Uh, and January, I'll be in New York City. I'm going to uh, Arizona in February, and yeah, lots lots of stuff on the on the horizon. But um, but I'm you know I'm last year I spent a lot of time abroad, and uh, I'm trying to make sure I, I have a press trip uh, actually at the end of the month with uh, with Toronto Tourism. So I'm trying to focus on what makes Toronto special and and as and, and Ontario special, and uh, you know Ontario as far as I can remember is roughly the size of 15 Ireland's. Wow. Yeah. When I was a kid, I just kind of thought, eh, Ontario, what's here, you know, and I, and I'm realizing that, you know, think about that for a second, right? If, if this is a, a this is a landmass, that's 15 times a country, which I think I could travel for a lifetime. I mean, what's, what's, what am I missing? And so that's, that's what I've been writing about. That's what I've been trying to figure out. And uh, so that's, what's on the horizon, really um, lots of things. And, keeps me uh keeps me fired up and excited to to travel i think i took for granted the fact that i could be excited about travel around ontario and canada um and you know from traveling around the u.s uh, as well it's it's i think going to anywhere new uh really enriches your life absolutely so uh so you and i are both into inspiring travel so where are uh the places that people can go to be inspired by where you've traveled to yeah so obviously my my blog uh, is more ontario focused now but i have tons of content on asia etc you can go to travelingmitch.com um and uh all social media traveling mitch i always say 1l because i'm canadian but uh, <laughs> traveling mitch 1l uh on on all social media pinterest twitter instagram facebook i'm active on all channels you know which is nice and time consuming and um uh, and if you want to see some of my writing Kind of from our, from different publications, etc. www.travelingmitch.com slash portfolio, and you can see all that I'm about. And uh, you know, hopefully, having listened to me here, you uh, you want to hear more about what I have to say. You're not like, oh, I'm done with this guy. Uh, you know, but, <laughs> oh, uh, I, I think we, you know, I'm I'm I, sorry. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, I think we've only uh, just scratched the surface of uh, of of interest in terms of what you've done. So. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I definitely appreciate you spending the time today, and I'll, I'll post uh, the links in our show notes as well, so uh, they can go out to travelfuelslife dot com and uh, be able to listen to the show there or uh, check out the show notes. And I'll see if I can get some extra links from you as well, and make it easy for people to uh, connect with you and see what you're doing. It's a, a fasc- fascinating life that you've lived so far. So, uh, and it'll be fun watching you. Uh, progress as you uh as you grow and uh also learning more about canada as as we're seeing what you're doing in toronto as well so yeah and ontario at large and i i think uh well first you know i appreciate the kind words about about the stuff that i'm doing and uh you know it's uh it's humbling that people follow along and find my content useful but you know when i first started blogging it's in 2010 and i was living in norway and and i was predominantly blogging to keep my parents off my back you know because they're <laughs> asking what what i was up to and i just say hey go to the most recent blog post you know but i think now I really see blogging as a as as creating itineraries and tools for other people to be comfortable traveling, and mm. it's kind of the same mission that you have with this podcast, which is giving giving people real opinions of uh, of what places are all about, and and sort of softening the blow so that they can feel comfortable going there. And and in the case of Ontario, it's really just uh, for people to see what was always in their backyard that they might not have been taking advantage of, but. Uh, 
you know, I'm happy. It, it, I know from getting, e- I mean, you can, everybody can email me at Chris at travelingmitch.com, but I, my approach has always just been to be, to be honest and to be humble and to try and, uh, try and remember that, uh, you know, everybody knows something that I don't and, uh, and I'm lucky to know the things that I do, but there's, there's so much more for me to learn. I mean, uh, I've seen 79 countries, but, uh, for me, uh, I think about the countries I, I haven't seen while, while remembering that I'm fortunate to have seen so much. Nice. Well, good. Well, thank you very much, Chris. I want to wrap things up and, uh, I think we could turn this into a mini series if we wanted to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, so much to yeah. talk about in terms of travel and only uh, so that's why we give out uh, travelingmitch.com right because then they'll be able to uh, <laughs> exactly. check out a little bit more of what's going on well thank you very much and I, I look forward to seeing much more of your content down the road yeah for sure thanks so much to, for having me on and uh, you know anyone can feel free to reach out to me I'm uh, I'm not too big to answer a message on any platform all right thanks Chris and I hope everybody got a great feel for the experience of a multicultural Toronto. I think when you're planning out your spring and summer travel plans, it's definitely a place you'll want to consider. Lots to do there, underground Toronto and all the different multicultural neighborhoods that you can go visit. Sounds like a trip around the world without actually having to go around the world. I hope that was informative for you and that uh, you enjoyed the episode. And until next week, I wish you safe travels. I'm your host, Drew Hannish, and thanks for listening to Travel Fuels Life.